Hey, Jack and Jackson, thank you so much for taking this time to spend it with me. It's such an honor to have you. Awesome. Thanks, Deepak. Happy to be here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yep. Let's do this rapid side fire sort of questions. So, Jack, if you were the governor for one day of North Carolina, what would you do? Convince the legislature to expand Medicaid. Yeah. To save as many lives as we could possibly save. Nice. Jackson, if you had to change one rule in the state government process, what would that be? If I had one rule to change, gosh, in the state government process, I would like, uh, I would like for there to, in committee meetings, I would like for them to be uh, more tallied votes. So we, so as a bill was going through the committee, normally they just do voice votes. Um, and so I would prefer that the, the votes have to be tallied so we know exactly kind of where more people stood as bills were going through committee before they hit the floor. That's what I would like to see. Good. Jack, why do you think it is important for the youth to be involved in government relations? The youth are the future of our country. And being involved in government relations, whether you're employed there or whether you're just an active reader or critical TV watcher, helps you understand what the issues are, helps you understand what positions the candidates are taking so that you can be a better, more informed, more active participant in the affairs of both your local community, your state, and your nation. So everyone should be interested in government relations, whether they work there or not, and learn as much as they can about who's making decisions, why they're making them, and what the impact's going to be. Absolutely. I agree. Jackson, what is the one skill you think is essential for someone to be a good lobbyist? Um, one skill, um, I think a lot of endurance is one thing, uh, uh, accompanied with an, atten an attention to detail, um, because a lot of what you really learn when you're lobbying is not necessarily what, um, the member, the, the representative or the Senator is saying. It's not really what you learn about what they're saying is what you see going on behind it all the time. It's who's talking to who. Um, and, and, and they're very long days and the schedule is very erratic. Um, so like, so like when you get up in the morning and you're going down to the legislative building and you know that it's a busy day, like my wife always asks me, what time will you be home? And I can never answer that question for her. Like most people get done with work at five, they get in their car and they go home and they're home by five 30. That's, that doesn't work like that for a lobbyist. Um, we could be there uh, past midnight on, on some days. So you need a lot of endurance um, a, a, and a lot of attention to detail, and you have to be very flexible. If you're like a super type A personality where everything has to happen at the same time every single day, it'll be a hard profession for you because you really got to fly by the seat of your pants uh, like for most of the days. Good answer. Jack? Do you have any role models in your life? I have tons. Uh, I grew up in Burke County. Senator Sam Irvin was a United States Senator from North Carolina uh, when I was growing up and in high school. And he went on to become famous as the chairman of the Senate Watergate Committee that investigated Watergate. But before that and before Senator, he was a justice on the North Carolina Supreme Court. So he was one of my early role models. Uh, there were a couple of lawyers I knew when I was growing up in Morganton. Claude Sitton who went on to become a Superior Court judge and Bob Bird. Uh, they were just outstanding lawyers, honest people, contributed to the community, did a ton of things. Uh, most of my role models were people I met uh, as I became interested in, in politics. Um, my wife's father, Horace Carnegie, was a member of Congress and a uh, federal lobbyist uh, after that. And he was one of my role models. He was one of the kindest, most thoughtful, most gentle persons I had ever known. 
treated everyone as if he were the president of the United States. And, and I saw him do that when he got in a building in the Capitol and they had elevator operators. He treated that person the same way he, he would have treated the senator he was going to, to, to go see. Uh, Jim Hunt, uh, I worked with and was a great role model. Rufus Emerson has been a role model of mine. I had the great fortune one summer to work for Richardson Pryor, another member of Congress from North Carolina, from, from Greensboro. Um, a, another person who was just kind and thoughtful and treated everybody so well. And uh, those are some of the role models that I had growing up and as I got into politics and as I you know, became an elected official myself and, and tried to do the things that I saw those people do. Jackson, can you tell us what was the most momentous thing in your career so far? Okay, so um, I like to I like to think that I had a kind of a unique introduction um, into lobbying because one I had I had a great role model in him who's been doing this since since the late seventies, um, but he had uh, he had run into some health issues. And he is the recipient of a heart transplant. Um, but before he got the heart transplant, he was very, very sick. And he had to be hospitalized. And so all of a sudden, I'd only been lobbying for a little over a year. And like, I, and he was in the hospital. We were in the middle of session. I was all on my own. And I think the three weeks he was, uh, one of our clients is the town of Cary. Um, like uh, what? And like he was in the hospital for over two to three weeks. But when he was in the hospital, like I got to run the show, and I got almost all of Kerry's entire legislative agenda accomplished when he was in the hospital. And so that was the big kind of like eureka moment for me. That's like, oh man, I can do this. Like I like I can do this. I love to have him. Meaning, I'd love to have the judge by my side, but I don't necessarily need him. Like I can do this in, in the hospital. So um, it was a really uh, I, I will always remember those um, those bills that I was able to push through from start to finish. My first ones, really, ever that I did on my own. I would say that that that's my biggest so far. That is really cool, yeah. Jack. Jack, what is the best compliment you have ever received? Uh, that's a tough one. The, well, the one that comes comes to mind uh, happened late one night. At the, at the General Assembly. And Jackson's right about the timing. You never know when you get to go home when you work as a lobbyist in the General Assembly. This was getting near the end of the session. And frequently there will be a hundred bills on the calendar when they're trying to get enough things finished so that they can adjourn. And it was one of those times, you know, it's, it's in the summertime and it's hot outside. and we're inside and it's around midnight and I was working on a bill for a client and there were some other lobbyists who were not on the same side that I was on, uh, on the bill. And there was a question of whether I was going to be able to get my bill brought up and get the issues presented while the legislature was, was trying to adjourn. And there was a young woman who was working as a summer intern for one of the lobbyists who opposed me on that particular issue. And we had decided that we were not going to push the bill. And so the summer intern came up to me and, and said, the senior partner at the law firm asked me to talk to you about whether you're going to bring this bill up. And I told her, I said, we've decided we're not going to bring the bill up. And she said, good. That means I can go home because my senior partner said that he could trust whatever I told him. And I took that as a real, real compliment that they trusted me, that, that I was, my word was good. And, you know, that's that's the kind of reputation I wanted to have in the General Assembly. And um, it just that was a really, really good compliment for her to be able to tell me. We trust you enough that I can go home. If you say you're not going to bring it up, it's not coming up. 
yeah, that's that is something else. Jackson, if you could have dinner with three people, who would those be, dead or alive? Dead or alive from any era? Yep. Oh my gosh! All right, three people. Um. So, I think, I think I would love to bring. Okay, I would love to bring Barack Obama. Um, I would love to bring just three people. Gosh, that almost makes it harder. I would like Barack Obama. I would like. Um, Let's go way back. I would like to bring Jesus Christ there because I would like his opinion of what all's going on right now. <laughs> and to uh and to throw some gasoline on the fire. Let all right, so let's bring Barack Obama, Jesus Christ, and we'll bring Mussolini in there. And we'll just watch him argue it out. <laughs> yeah, I would like to be on the sidelines in that dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a tough question yeah. That is a tough question. Yeah. all right jack here's uh, another for you if you had the time capsule to go back in time which time would you go from about 1770 until about 1790 when america was being born um I, I know the living conditions were tough then, no air conditioning, not much electricity, things like that. But to be around the founding fathers, that unique combination we had of minds and will to have done what they did to create this country the way they did, that has lasted for hundreds of years now, I hope it lasts hundreds of years more. Some of that's in jeopardy right now. But to have been able to talk to Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and James Madison and, you know, the people who, I know the Declaration of Independence is what everybody thinks of first and foremost, but to, to talk to the people who wrote the Constitution, my goodness, I think is the greatest document you know, ever written by man. Um, and to have have the opportunity to be around those people and hear them discuss those issues and how to create a country out of whole cloth. You know, we're the first country in the world that was created by political ideas and not by religion. You know, almost every other country that you think of, it's a religious group that, that starts. Uh, and for the United States, it, it was just the opposite. It, it was political theory about how should people govern themselves. And I just think it would have been so fascinating to have been here, especially if you were in a position to be able to talk to them and, and listen to what they had to say. Nice. Jackson, the last one for you. Can you tell us if you had the power to change anything in the world? What would you change? The power to change anything in the world. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think I think that that we have a big disparity still, even in modern uh, modern America and even in modern countries uh, between the haves and the have-nots. And I believe that um, that there is a, that it, that there is still a huge difference between the haves and the have-nots in every single uh, in, in every country. And I would like to see whether it's healthcare, whether it's the justice system, whether it's all all different kinds of things. There's just such a huge disparity still in the modern era between the haves and the have-nots. And I would like to somehow close that gap to where every single person had the right to health care. Every single person had the same right to a fair trial in a justice system as anybody else. And so that's what I would like to, that's what I would like. I know that's not one specific thing, but I would like to close the the large gap between the haves and the have nots pretty much all over the all over the world if possible. 
Nice. Good answer. With that, let's jump a little bit into your past. Uh, Jack, can you tell us, like, you know, where did you grow up and how was your childhood like and were you interested in politics? I grew up in Drexel. It's a small town, 200 miles west of Raleigh, right in the edge of the Blue Ridge Mountains, about halfway between Charlotte and Asheville. I'm the youngest of eight children. So I, I grew up in a big family um, out in the country on about 15 acres of land, uh, not a commercial farm, but a big family farm where we raised a lot of our own vegetables and, and, and things like that. Uh, pretty much a, an idyllic childhood growing up in the country like that, in a big family like that, uh, you know, playing baseball with my buddies, uh, things, all, you know, all those wonderful things like that. I was exposed to politics at an early age. Uh, my mother was a Democrat. My father was a Republican. And I can remember them sitting around the kitchen table debating uh, Eisenhower Stevenson elections in the 50s, <laughs> you know, when I was just a little kid. And so I was exposed to politics at an early age, you know in my family with, with my older brothers and sisters being interested in it. I remember 1960 um, when my sister uh, got all involved in the campaign that year, campaigning for Kennedy for president and Terry Sanford for governor. And so then when I went away to college in, in 1968, I went to NC State uh, and immediately got interested in what was going on there uh, started volunteering for campaigns as a student um, and then decided to major in politics, to study as much of it as I could. Went to law school at, at Wake Forest uh, and then came back to Raleigh in 1975 to work for the Attorney General. Um, and so politics has been a part of my life and my career ever since. Um, I ran twice for public office and was elected to the Court of Appeals. So I, I know what elections are all about. Um, I've campaigned for a lot of candidates. Um, I can truthfully say I have been to every county in North Carolina. I've, I've been to almost all the courthouses in North Carolina. I was director of the court system for uh, about a year and a half. And I, I made sure I got out into the courthouses to meet the people who, who did the real work uh, in the judicial system, who the clerks of court, who do magnificent jobs, the judges, the DAs, the public defenders, all the great people in, in the courthouse. I'm a courthouse rat. I love courthouses. I love what happens in them. Uh, and, you know, ju judicial systems a big part of politics, too. Um, and so I guess you can say that, that I am a lifelong, as Rufus likes to say, recovering politician. <laughs> so, but I enjoy it. Uh, I love being a part of how decisions are made. Um, one of my great professors at NC State was uh, Dr. Abraham Holtzman. Um, and he was a Rhodes Scholar and he could have taught anywhere in the world. And fortunately, we had him at NC State. And my first course in politics was under him. And the first day, his first question to any of the students was, what is politics? And so there were all these different answers coming from all around the room. And he finally said, well, let's just say this. Politics is the way we decide who gets what. And that's sort of the way I viewed it since then. And since I was 18 years old, politics is how we decide who gets what. And I've wanted to be a part of that decision-making process since then. And so I've generally devoted most of my career and my life to doing that very thing. Yeah, that's really inspiring. And and did you like um, decide that you're going to get, did you get a law degree? I, I did, uh, I'm, okay. I'm a licensed attorney. Okay. I've been for 47 years. Okay, <laughs> okay. And, and the, the law degree was because you thought that's probably something you were interested in to get into politics? Well, I, you know, I had mentioned sometime, uh, well, I, I, listen, my role models growing up, a number of them were attorneys. And I was, I was impressed with 
with what I saw Sam Irvin and Claude Sitton and Bob Bird do. And so I, from an early age, thought it would really be nice if I would be able to do things like that. And, you know, not everybody who goes to law school is interested in politics and not everybody who's interested in politics has to be a lawyer, but there are certain connections between the two. Uh, you know, one is an educational process, the other as a way of life, really, politics. Um, and I think it was just sort of natural for me to use my law degree to first do government work. You know, I was a public servant for a long time, which I really enjoyed. Um, and it just sort of, the two just sort of naturally fell together. That, you know, being a lawyer and working in politics um, was you know, just kind of a natural following. One of the persons I met when I was an undergraduate at NC State was Jim Hunt. And this was before many people knew much about him. He, he was a young lawyer practicing law in Wilson and was viewed as a potential rising star in politics. Um, everybody knew that he was ambitious and that he worked very hard. Um, and of course, I, I worked in his first campaign for Lieutenant Governor. I was a student volunteer and served on his statewide campaign coordinating committee uh, when I was a senior in college. Um, and then went to work for him after he became governor in 1977. And, and then I truly learned how hard he worked. <laughs> he, he was an amazing person. And, and the great thing about him that I've tried to learn to do is discipline. You know, Jackson talked about endurance as, as being one of the qualities you have to have as a lobbyist, and I, I certainly agree with that. But another good trait to have is discipline. Uh, whether you're a lobbyist or in anything else you're doing, but especially in the law and in politics, just, just being able to say, this is the plan, these are the goals, and this is where we have to go and what we have to do. Uh, and Jim Hunt is possibly the best at doing that of anybody I've ever seen of uh, saying here's our target guys here's where we're going to go and you know then he would bring all the men and women together and say here's here's what we're going to do and he would get it done and I tried to learn some of that discipline myself it's difficult it's it's hard to have the kind of discipline Jim Hunt has didn't you start out with driving him around I did do some of that yeah. I was not the primary driver in that lieutenant governor's campaign, but because I was still in school mm -hmm. uh, and, and still had to go to class, uh, but I would usually go down to the office. We had a small office down on Fayetteville Street, and I would go down there at the end of my classroom work at two or three o'clock in the afternoon and stay till seven or eight o'clock at night. And sometimes on weekends, um, Mike Davis was his regular campaign driver, and sometimes for Mike to be able to have a weekend off to do something with his family, I would take his place and drive the governor wherever he, or then just Jim Hunt running for lieutenant governor, but I would drive him from place to place uh, for meetings, yes. You get to know a lot about a person when you drive him around uh, like that. And, and I got to know him well and uh, I have just great admiration for him, his work ethic, his, his personal characteristics, just he's, he's been a wonderful person. Yeah, that's a truly inspiring story. Jackson, tell us a little bit about how was it growing up in a household with Jack and, you know, where did you grow up and where, how did you stumble across this world of government relations? Sure. So, um, <clears throat> well, so when I, I was born, um, or my earliest memories, uh, Jack, we, we all call him the judge. The, uh, the judge was already working for Governor Hunt. And so he was, you know, uh, it was a very, very uh, demanding job, and so he was he was gone a lot. But I, but I remember that there are a lot of times he would have to take me with him to the governor's mansion, like late like late at night. And so I pretty much crawled all over the governor's mansion at a very uh, young age. And then he started. Uh, he was he was appointed uh, to the court of appeals, but then had to run statewide. Was it twice? He had to run statewide. Watch, yes. And um, and so that's why I joke that I worked I worked on my first campaign when I was five, uh, because he he was uh, the judge was running statewide and um, 
And so, and I would, and I would go everywhere around with him and I would hand out little cards with his face on it that said, uh, vote for judge Jack Kazor. But, but so I have always, you know, I don't know, I don't know a life without politics. I just really don't. Um, because, you know, from my earliest memories, you know, he was a judge and had to run statewide. And, um, and so it's something I've always, just always, always, always been interested in. And I went to uh, Wake Forest University, but I um, was not a political science major. I, I majored in communications and public relations. Um, and so I have found it very, very interesting um, how lobbying has just as much to do with the public relations aspect of things as it does with the political science aspect of things. And so me majoring in, in that really um, unknowingly at the time really gave me a, a great foundation um, for when I did move back to, to Raleigh to start working with the judge in a, in a lobbying and government relations field. So to kind of answer your question, I, I, you know, politics has been part of my, my entire life as far back as I can remember. And so when, when I did get the opportunity to come down and uh, come back to Raleigh and uh, work in government relations, I just kind of, I kind of felt like I was, I had a, a great opportunity to kind of hit, hit the ground running because I had a pretty good background in, in, what, in what it takes to be a lobbyist. Nice. And if, if you had to say one thing which you learned from your dad, Jack, what would that be? Um, the one thing that I learned from him? Yeah. Oh, um, well, that is very important that um, you all that you that you always be honest and you always be transparent um, because there's kind of this like running joke uh, going around the legislative building that if that if you uh, are not honest it better be really really worth it because that is the only time you will ever get to do get to you know you'll you'll get you know ostracized and uh, kind of another thing that he hit on earlier is that you tr is that you need to treat everybody no matter what their position the absolute same because the legislative assistance to the to the senators and the house members are just as important as the members themselves like if you can get in good with that legislative assistant you can get in good with that senator they will move you to the front of the line i am living proof <laughs> and, uh, and so it is just like uh so it, it so the one thing i really did learn from him as well is always be honest always be transparent and treat everybody like they were the Speaker of the House, because you will never know um, when that one person will, will be able to help you like you never imagined. Good answer. Jack, can you tell us if, um, if someone was interested in getting into lobbying and advocacy, what should their first step be? Go to the building when the legislature is in session and watch as much as you can and ask questions of anybody and everybody. And, and that's part of what I had to do. I, I was fortunate enough um, one summer when I was at, in school at NC State to get an internship with what was then the North Carolina Citizens for Business and Industry, now the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce. and it was one of those sessions that lasted well into the summer. And so I had finished my college year in May. And so I had a couple of months that my job, part of my job for, for the association was to cover the legislature to help prepare a weekly newsletter on issues that were important to the business community in the state. And so I, marched myself down to the General Assembly on Monday afternoon. And, uh, you know, they meet from Monday afternoon through Thursday. Back in those days, they met Monday afternoon through Friday uh, about uh, lunchtime. And to go down there and try to find out what was going on. And so the way I did that was by asking as many people as I could to tell me everything they could tell me about what was going on and especially the reporters <laughs> those were the ones who really knew what was going on in those days there were not a lot of lobbyists 
And most of the time, the building was fairly empty, except for the members uh, and their staffs. And they didn't have big staffs then. Not everybody had a secretary, for example. They had a secretarial pool in the basement of the legislative building. There was no legislative office building then. Everything was done in that one building. And most legislators just had an office and didn't have a secretary. And so the, the building was quiet. Uh, there weren't a lot of people there. I, I bet there weren't more than 25 or 30 paid lobbyists at that time. You know, there are, what, 800 now? I'm yeah. not sure what the final number is, but it's, I think we're getting close to 1,000 registered lobbyists yeah. in the state of North Carolina now. But then there, there were very few. Um, and so the people I found who really knew things were the reporters who were covering the legislature. Jack Aulis was one I remember in particular worked for the News Observer. And he was, he knew everything. And, and so I followed him around as much as I could and asked him everything I could. And, and so if a person wants to get interested in being a lobbyist, you need to understand how it works. And so the first thing I would do is whenever they're in session, go to the building, watch what's going on, ask questions of a lot of people. And a lot of people start out saying, I know this is a stupid question, but when you're dealing in the legislation, there are no stupid questions. <laughs> you need to delve down as deeply as you can and ask as much as you can and read as much as you can about what's going on. Um, we don't have as good a coverage of the legislature as we used to have. Uh, you know, the, the press is not as strong as it used to be. Newspapers aren't what they used to be. Um, but there are services like yours that track what's going on. And, you know, so, so if, if I had somebody, let's say Jackson just decided he wanted to be a lobbyist, but didn't have the background that he had growing up, uh, you know, in my family, I would tell him, go to the building, ask questions, read everything you can read about it. And then you'll sort of get a feel for what's going on and you can make a, a more informed decision about whether it is something you really want to do. I enjoyed it. I, you know, that was 1971 <laughs> was, was my first year working in the legislature. And I've been involved in almost every session since then. Uh, you know, not as much when I was at law school, simply because of the demands of, of law school. But, uh, especially once I came back in 1975, working for the Attorney General, I've, I've been to the legislative building every session. It, it's an enjoyable thing to do. Uh, it's a lot more work than most people think. You know, a lot of people think lobbying is just having an expense account and taking a lot of people out to expensive dinners can't uh, do that anymore can't do that anymore nope. and i've always felt that the role of a lobbyist is more of an educator mm -hmm. than anything else you know i have to educate enough people about what my clients issues are and why they should support my clients issues so, so you really have to be an educator I, i've got a friend who calls me a guidance counselor you know, my role is to guide people to the right decision. <laughs> so if those who think lobbying has a bad connotation to it, they can always call themselves educators or guidance counselors. So, but the end result's the same. You know, your goal is to try to help uh, 170 educated women and men make the right decision. Yeah. And a lot of um, the real successful lobbyists uh, right now in present time started out as staffers for um, for members. Um, you know, they they showed up, they got jobs as whether they were uh, legislative assistants or whether they or they were um, research assistants. But like some of the most successful lobbyists right now started out as staffers for actual members because the key is is the relationships is getting to know all these people. And, and when you work, um, when you work in that building as a legislative assistant or a research assistant or anything, anything like that, like you, you get to meet and make those connections. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the really successful lobbyists now started off as, um, as, as staff members. Nice. And Jackson, if, um, you are, you're right now in North state strategies, can you talk us a little bit about, you know, what the, your mission here is in this organization and what kind of policies do you work on? Sure. So um, we, uh, 
so we're an independent lobbying firm. Um, we're, we're not associated with any major law firm. Um, you know, uh, the judge throughout the years has worked for Parker Poe, Adams and Bernstein and for Womble Carlisle, um, which were big law firms, but broke out on his own. So I like to think we're kind of like a craft brewery of a lobbying firm. But um, but we we represent a ton of different clients just in the you know the short time that I've been working with him. We've represented uh, the city of Cary, the city of Wilson, uh, the National Board for Certified Teachers. So we've done education work. We um, represent Honor Bridge, which used to be Carolina Donor Services, which is all the organ donation. Uh, we represent the North Carolina Retire Retired Government Employees Association. So we handle the state and local retirees. Um, and, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm missing a lot, but you know, we, there's a whole bunch of different stuff that we've got. To do. And that's, that's what's really fun about this is because we're, we're consistently getting different clients with different issues. We just picked up the Solid Waste Association of North America, um, SWANA, the North Carolina chapter. So we're the uh, trash and recycling lobbyists as well. So, you know, we, we just, you know, we've gotten to deal with all kinds of issues all over the place. Uh, we represent casino party aces. They do, um, they, what they do is they run like casino nights for like law firms and nonprofits and stuff like that. So we, we've, uh, we've done work with them. So it's, it's been a whole bunch of different stuff. And Judge, I'm sure I'm, uh, I'm sure you, I saw you wanted to jump in. So go oh, ahead. We've done work for Dell Computers over the Dell years. Computers. Uh, yep. we, we helped write the major recycling bill in the state of North Carolina when I was working for Dell. We represent bars and taverns. Bar and tavern. They, they have an association, and, and so we try to help them with issues. We represent a speedway, Rockingham Speedway. Um, and over the years, I've represented some other healthcare clients as well, uh, Association for Home and Hospice Care. I've done work for them uh, over the years, and um, kidney dialysis folks. So it's been a wide variety of issues. Uh, and that's one of the things that I like so much about it is there's so much different, so many different issues and so much you have to learn in order to do what we do. And I'm glad Matt Jackson mentioned SWANA because that's a client where our mission is really going to be education mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't understand how difficult the work is now in, in SWANA the people who comprise SWANA are the local governments who are responsible for dealing with solid waste and the contractors, the, the companies they hire to help them do that. And I, I never had any idea how complicated that was and what the issues were until we started working for them uh, at the beginning of this session, this short session. Um, you probably know a lot about the PFAS, PFAS, the chemicals that got into the Cape Fear River from the manufacturing plant near Cumberland County, and all that the concern everybody has about water treatment. Well, there's a big issue involving those PFAS in solid waste disposal too, because so many things have PFAS in them that nobody knows anything about. If, if your shirt is permapressed, for example, that's PFAS. If you have cookware that has a nonstick coating, PFAS. Scotch guard, PFAS. Scotch guard. A ton of things like that that nobody knows anything about. At the end of their useful cycle, where do they end up? The county landfill. And so we've got major issues with PFAS in virtually every county in the state that has a landfill, and that's literally everywhere. There are some regional landfills in some of the smaller counties. And so, you know, part of our job is going to be to educate the General Assembly about those kinds of issues, about tire recycling, for example, about electronics recycling. Um, and to me, that's what's so challenging and so interesting about this job and why I keep doing it. I have a lot of people ask me if I'm not old enough to retire. I guess I am. But I still love the challenge. You're only what 72. Do. What's that? I said you're yeah. only 72. Only 72. <laughs> so, uh, just a little older than Tom Brady. Uh, <laughs> he's still active. <laughs> so, 
Uh, so, you know, I keep doing it because I like that challenge uh, of helping an organization like that, that needs help. And uh, I'm really learning a lot working with them and uh, working on their issues. Nice. And, and especially if you're into politics and you're into current events and you really are passionate about this stuff, there's no job like ours. It's like we're on the front lines of everything. Like it is, it's amazing. It, it, and, and to me, it's just been um, such a great experience because I really feel every session like I'm watching like history unfold yeah. because we are in very unique political times um, and so with with very unique ideas um, uh, coming out. And so I, I've, you know, these last these last 10 years have been a big transition, not just for America, but also the state of North Carolina. And so I've, I've gotten to be on the front lines and just kind of got to watch everything happen. So it's rewarding and frustrating and amazing all at the same time. Yeah. That's really cool. Jack, um, I would like you to tell us a few closing remarks. Tell us, you know, what, what is it that you like to share with our audience? Any words of advice of whether do's, don'ts, um, or your future, where would you like to be? Well, the do's and don'ts. Don't think politics is a dirty word. Yeah. It's not. Just remember Abe Holtzman's definition. It's how we decide who gets what. And that makes it important enough for everybody to be interested and to be concerned. And that would be my do. As a citizen, you have an obligation to know what's going on, to know who you're voting for. So many people just vote without having any idea who the candidates are. And the press does a good job in telling us who they are. If people would just pay attention and read and listen and learn who these people are and know who they're voting for and know what the issues are. So, so, so those are my, my do's and don'ts. Um, I've had a, a lifetime of politics. Um, I've enjoyed it. It's been a rewarding career. I, I loved my work in public service. I, I did over 20 years um, as an employee of the state of North Carolina, and I loved that. I loved representing the state as, as an attorney. I loved representing Governor Hunt, and, and I loved being a judge. Um, and, and so I spent a good 20 years doing that, and, and, and now uh, I just celebrated my 25th anniversary <laughs> of being in private practice since I left the court in 1997. Uh, um, one of my clients I have represented since July the 1st, 1997, that's the North Carolina Retired Governmental Employees Association. So I have worked for them for 25 years. Um, and, and that's a good feeling to stick with somebody that long. And especially knowing that I'm working for other public servants to try to help them with their issues to, to make sure that the state properly funds the retirement system, which they do very well, the health care system for retirees, which they do very well. Uh, and we still need to work on, you know, better ways to get COLAs for them and bonuses, uh, you know, because inflation has been tough on fixed income folks the last several years. So there's still a lot of work left to do there. Uh, but it, I've, I've had a good life. I've had an enjoyable life doing what I'm doing. And I recommend it. Uh, you get a lot of satisfaction. Jackson's right. Sometimes it's frustrating. And, you know, sometimes you want to bang your head against the wall. But I've had a great life. Jackson, any final words you want to add? Well, you know, just kind of um, to piggyback on what he was saying is stay educated, you know, uh, stay informed um, and get involved. You know, it, it's not very hard this day and age to start getting involved in campaigns like um, start supporting these people with the same ideologies that you have, because trust me, that running for office is not is not easy anymore. It, you used to have to try to talk people in to like running for a state house seat. Now they're spending millions of dollars during election time. Like you used to have to like try to talk people into running for city council. Now these are just, these are huge elections. So people need the help, stay involved, stay educated, and you know, um, find something you're passionate about. And, uh, and so if you are, if you are passionate about politics, the way the two of us are, you know, um, it's not that hard to get involved. And so that, that would be my advice is to stay educated and get involved. 
perfect ending to this wonderful conversation. Jackson, I know I'm pretty sure Jack is very proud of your work. And Jack, <laughs> it's such it's such an honor to have you here. Thanks so much for both of you to be here. I would thank you. We were honored to be asked. Yeah, this is great.